I really appreciate the opportunity to present here. And also I see in the uh, in the audience uh, lots of uh, old friends and happy to meet with new friends. So uh, today, uh, given that it's a, a 25 minute talk with five minute questions, I will probably only go through some of the results and I will be happy to discuss the derivation or or f further applications uh, uh, offline. And before I start, I also want to uh, kind of do a quick advertisement for our group. Our group is a bunch of uh, crazy theorists trying to find out the non-equilibrium thermodynamic rules uh, uh, if, well, the rules that are help, help, helpful for us to to understand the design principles of a, a lifelike matter. For example, a lifelike matter like a nano robot that is really smart to carry out things, or maybe a blob of blob of chemicals in a nanoscale uh, uh, bag uh, uh, could perform certain tasks. They should be able to sense surrounding information. They should probably have intelligent response rather than just purely sensing. And also the, the better har harvest energy from the environment autonomously. And uh, also if, if you, they, are, uh, they are going to be uh, useful nano robots for you or, or a little uh, uh, lifelike matter, they better to be controllable. So in our group, we are uh, kind of spanning wide on uh, almost uh, all, all of those four aspects. And the tools we use are uh, from non-equilibrium thermodynamics, information theory, and a little healthy dose of math. Um, uh, the healthy uh, depends on what you think. All right. So, uh, and, and we have made some uh, baby steps or toddler steps uh, since my son is 4.5 years old. I think it's more toward toddler steps. Um, uh, that is uh, to discover the design principle and theory behind the lifelike matter. And there are different aspects re ranging from harnessing energy from the environment to uh, sensing information and uh, to uh, to non-equilibrium control and building smart molecules. And I will probably just uh, focus, get back to focus on today's, uh, uh, today's topic and end of the advertisement time. So before we start, I would like to ask the question, in our mind, what do we think is a sensor? Well, here I'm listing a few examples. On the left is uh, what people consider as a temperature sensor. It's a protein channel that is sitting on the cell membrane. And when temperature change, the channel would have a different uh, capability of transporting uh, particles through it. So in, in that sense, the downstream reaction network inside the cell would sense the flow change and uh, would, uh, would, uh, would gain the information about the temperature of the environment. And uh, on the upper right, you see a concentration sensor or a ligand receptor that usually also is a, is a, is a, a protein on the cell membrane and that is able to bind or unbind with the, a certain type of ligands. And when it binds with the ligand, it will uh, kind of cause a configuration change of the protein. So that would trigger different kinds of downstream reactions that can be used to infer information about the external concentration. And the third one I want to uh, kind of uh, highlight is not only sensors exist in living things, uh, humans are also building sensors. For example, they might uh, design some protein or certain molecules that you can put into a microscopic environment. And then by just observing the state or the transition of the state of, the, uh, of, of that uh, probe molecule, uh, you should be able to infer certain information of interest of, uh, of, the, of its surrounding. So what is really in common for all of those is that a sensor is something that is in contact with an environment and the environment has certain parameters that we are not sure of, but the sensor can experience that uh, and the sensor's dynamic will be influenced by the environment. And then by looking at the sensor, either we looking at it uh, through a microscope or the downstream reaction network of the cell, since it's change, then someone can infer uh, or something can infer uh, the, the information that is usually not accessible directly uh, to, to, the, uh, to the downstream. So uh, to uh, just briefly summarize uh, what we will cover today, uh, first of all, I want to uh, uh, highlight that we want to compare the traditional steady state description of a sensor to a, probably a slightly new non-stationary trajectory description of biosensors in general. And by doing that, we can do multiple things. First is that, Rather than thinking a sensor as a uh, sensor for temperature or sensor for concentration, we'd rather take a presumption-free perspective and to say that maybe the sensor's trajectory can allow us to measure many, many information rather than one. So in computer science, this is called multiplexing. 
It is a single molecule can serve as a channel of multiple channels of information. Can can a single cell? Uh, can a can a uh, can really a single molecule uh, sensor really do that? Well, the answer might be yes. And also, if they can do that, how can we have a presumption-free perspective on the accuracy or uh, sensitivity of a sensor? Now we suddenly no longer consider this as a concentration sensor, and this no longer considered as a temperature sensor, and welcome the idea that the environment might have multiple uh, multiple different uh, traits. For example, there be there can be temperature, there can be pressure, can be concentration of something or chemical potential or even viscosity. R really, what is the sensor most sensitive about? Can we have a systematic tool to actually estimate the sensor's capability without human's presumption? So that is one thing is uh, regarding multiplexing. And uh, at the end, if we have some time, I would love to uh, also uh, just show some very flash through some, some results that we have developed a, an inequality that can relate the rather hard to measure relative entropy of trajectories of a sensor uh, to something that is really easy to measure. And also that equality shines light on how should we design a good sensor, not only just a sensor for certain parameter, but sensor for sensing different temporal patterns or tell apart different temporal patterns. So uh, let us uh, start from this, <coughs> excuse me. Let us start from this uh, general picture of a sensor, or you can c consider that as a theorist uh, oversimplified picture of a sensor. So let's say there's a sensor of interest. It's probably a protein or something or molecular complex. And uh, it's experiencing an environment of multiple environmental parameters, might be temperature, pressure, chemical potential, uh, friction coefficient, if there's a fluid or something. And uh, uh, all of those environmental parameters will influence the dynamics of the sensor simultaneously. And when we talk about the sensor's dynamics, it's crucial for the sensor to make changes. And that change would allow the information to be transduced into the downstream reaction network or the cell. So here, let me draw you a, a rather oversimplified picture of a four state sensor. Now the sensor can go through four states and uh, they, they can basically have a, a configuration change and binding with the, uh, with the ligand and, uh, the, uh, and unbinding. So someone uh, uh, will, will consider that, well, the sensor is rather simple. It's just experiencing different environment and its interaction with the environment can be assumed as follows. The environment will set the transition probability rate of this uh, uh, tr transition probability uh, uh, rate uh, of, of uh, the transition of the, uh, <clears throat> of the sensor from one state to another. But now when we have to uh, sense the sensor, what we are observing is usually the dynamics of the sensor. We cannot see the environment or the downstream of the cell probably cannot direct, directly see the environment. What the downstream really observes is the sensor state. So it's one, two, three, four changing is being observed. And then the observer might accumulate some information on the dynamics of the sensor, like one transition to three and then back to one, two, blah, blah, blah. And with all of those information, uh, the, the, the downstream reaction network will have the role to actually do the inference. Because what the downstream reaction network really cares or the cell really cares is not just the dynamics of this little sensor, but from the sensor, what can I infer of the information of the environment? All right. So uh, with, with that, uh, let, let's uh, uh, oops, let me see. Uh, let, let's go to uh, uh, go to uh, one simple question. In this picture, it seems like a single molecule sensor is suffering from stochasticity, or the thermal noise is creating you such a messy and uh, annoying uh, random sequence of states. Taking a very simple example of a binary uh, state sensor of a ligand receptor which only has two states, zero as unbound and one as bound with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, ligand. Now, if you consider the, the sensor, it's going through a rather noisy trajectory that at some time is in state zero, sometimes at state one, and the observer is looking at this rather messy trajectory. Now, the traditional view would be to say that, okay, well, let's uh, uh, let's try to extract some information. And people would consider, well, let's integrate out the noise. In this move, you are taking the stochasticity as an adversary rather than your ally. So let, let me explain that. 
Well, people might think, okay, well, let me take the average of the binding fraction, or how much time of uh, how much fraction of the time is the sensor in a bound state? Well, that is called S bar here. And then people might just using very simple equilibrium thermodynamics, you can easily calculate the to infer the concentration of the ligand. It's just through this simple formula by just assuming detailed balance. Well, in this case, people might just say, okay, well, I have a, a, I have a, a nice, nice formula that given an S bar that I observe or the downstream reaction network observe, I can infer the concentration. But I want to put a little bit challenge here. Do you notice that in addition to S bar, on the right side of the equation, there are other parameters. For example, beta, inverse temperature, or free energy change. That is the binding and unbinding free energy change of the sensor. So I want to point out that this sensor is actually not responding only to the concentration. The sensor is responding to temperature and other physical parameters. And if you allow for the system to go out of equilibrium, like introducing a flow, the flow would also uh, cause the uh, uh, ca cause a different response. So the challenge lies here. If you have so many parameters, the S bar alone cannot really tell you the information of concentration, unless you already know the temperature, unless you already know the binding free energy. In other words, the sensor is really not a sensor of concentration alone, but it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sensor of a combination of variables. But how can we really infer the uh, the, the concentration? Well, here, I want to uh, give you two possible ways. Biologists have found interesting mechanisms in cells where. Uh, the, the, the downstream reaction network might be able to get rid of the dependence of other parameters. And this is usually called uh, a variable compensation. For example, temperature compensation is a mechanism where the performance of a system like a sensor or clock uh, that is no longer dependent on the, uh, on the temperature itself. But in reality, if you ju are just looking at a simple sensor like this, do you think it's possible we have such mechanism to compensate for the change of other parameters so that we can always accurately infer concentration? Maybe the answer is no. But what is the remedy there? Well, I want to introduce to you that stochasticity might not be your enemy, but might be your friend. Because through, stochasti uh, through the stochasticity or in the noise, multiple channels of information are actually scrambled into the stochastic trajectory of the sensor. And it's our job, or maybe some downstream reactions uh, network's job, to actually look at this information in this trajectory and try to maybe simultaneously infer all the parameters that we're interested in. So from now on, we should no longer presume the sensor rule or the sensor's uh, capability. We should not call this concentration sensor until we really are confident that yes, this is most sensitive to concentration and maybe secondly sensitive to temperature and thirdly sensitive to something else. So let me uh, uh, give you a, like a, a little bit more arg uh, arguing here. Why looking at the trajectory is better than just looking at the S bar? Well, the S bar is the average information, but with the same average of binding fraction, you might have different trajectories and those trajectory might correspond to different environment. So the task here is by looking at the trajectory itself, how many information can we really infer? Can we simultaneously infer all of the information? Uh, and if that's really possible, we, we should call that multiplexing, and we, we, which is a, a term that is coined in computer science. So now there are theoretical uh, questions. Even if this is possible, uh, how can we predict the number of independent information variables that can be transduced through a single sensor. And also, if you now suddenly uh, do not assume the sensor is a sensor for variable one or variable two, how do you really pro pro uh, provide a, uh, 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 sorry, uh, an objective evaluation of the sensor's sensitivity to each channel of information? Sorry, there's a typo. This should be a, 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 a objective here. So now let, let me give you a, a very simple theoretical framework. Now let's make an abstraction of the environment to be a bunch of parameters of your interest. It could be theta one, theta two, theta whatever, two, theta n, assuming that your environment might be fully described by n parameters. And what the sensor does, the sensor is this little Markov chain model that is just going through some transitions. And the sensor basically produces 
a trajectory, and it's a trajectory corresponding to uh to 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 a point in this uh environmental parameter space theta space. Now the question is, well, it looks like the sensor is a map mapping a point in this high dimensional parameter space into a trajectory probability. Because now consider there, there is a trajectory of lens tau. Well, every time you look at the sensor, it might be producing a different trajectory. But if you collect all the trajectory of the sensor of the same lens tau, you should be able to collect a probability distribution. And that probability distribution is given by this data. If you change a different environmental condition, you should expect a different probability distribution here. So now the task for us, like, well, that was the sensor's task. The sensor merely produced with a map that maps data into a bunch of trajectories or histograms of trajectories. What we should do is to ask, can we infer information of theta by only looking at the sensor's trajectories? So now if I, you allow me, I will represent the uh, trajectory's probability distribution into this probability simplex. So imagine the simplest trajectory is a two-point trajectory. Maybe the downstream reaction network only has the ability to resolve the trajectory and memorize trajectory of lens time lens one or two steps. Well, then in that case, the only possible states of the trajectory are 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0 for a binary state sensor. Now the probability simplex is described by this, uh, well, this little, uh, uh, well, simplex here. Uh, it has a dimensionality that is the number of state of the sensor raised to the number of time points that you can collect minus one. Through a very simple continuity argument, you can say that, well, the number of independent environmental thetas that I can infer is actually limited by the degree of freedom of the probability simplex. Because what I observe, the sensor, is really, I can observe the sensor for a long time and collect this uh, and figure out this probability and then through a point here, I want to infer a point here. And obviously, if this dimensionality here is three, you cannot infer more than three variables on the left through a very simple uh, continuity argument. So here we provide you with this upper bound of multiplexing, namely the number of parameters that one can sense from a uh, from uh, by observing the short trajectories of the sensor is limited by this ns raised to the nt minus one. And now uh, I want to also uh, point you, uh, maybe you should uh, move to the, to the paper that we actually provide a sharper bound because for, 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 for a sensor, usually there are uh, some symmetries of their probabilities, uh, probability simplex, meaning the probability of observing zero one trajectory will be equal to probability of observing one zero. So that further reduce the dimensionality of your probability space of the trajectory. And uh, then you should really just say that sharper bound is n theta smaller than equal to this thing minus the number of symmetries that the sensor has. And that cannot be easily expressed by an analytical formula. It depends really on the graph of the uh, sensor's uh, state. So uh, now we have answered the question of the upper bound of multiplexing. Uh, we also promised a, 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 a objective uh, uh, approach to evaluate the sensitivity of the multiplexing sensors. Well, how do we do that? Since the sensor provides you with a map, mapping a high dimensional theta space into a probability distribution of the X. Well, let's uh, perform an easy maximum likelihood estimation. For example, if I observe the sensor for a long enough time in an unknown theta, I collect a bunch of uh, trajectories of lens uh, tau, and I have m such trajectories. Then I can construct a histogram of the trajectory. Then by taking the logarithm of the probability distribution, given uh, arbitrary theta and maximize with respect to theta, uh, you will be able to find, uh, well, wherever the maximum is achieved is your best guess of the environmental uh, parameter theta here. So really, the, the best guess you can have is where the maximum of the likelihood function is achieved, where all of this thing is the likelihood function. Notice that this if argument. You, if yeah. you wait just um, uh, five minutes, just to yes, thank you. Yeah. Up. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. thank you. Um, and now, uh, if you look at this, you might say, well, that's, that's just traditional maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, well, what, what's really new here? 
remember, we do not uh, we, we do not assure you that all of the environmental parameters can be measured. There was, in the last page, an upper bound of multiplexing, meaning given the number of states and the number of time points you can memorize, uh, there is an upper bound of number of theta, a uh, number of degrees of freedom of theta that you can actually infer. So this maximum could not be achieved typically. So the likelihood function might not be this nice shape. It might have behave like this or in, in, uh, or it behaves uh, in, in other way. Basically, you cannot uh, fully estimate the, uh, the, uh, the, the theta from the environment. In that case, uh, we are not sure if, the, I, I'm pretty sure mathematicians have done this before, but we don't know where to refer to. So we term this a uh, rank deficient maximum likelihood estimation approach, where by uh, doing a, 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 a Hessian matrix of the likelihood function, or uh, people might be familiar with this uh, uh, and call that uh, Fisher information, uh, Fisher information matrix, we should be able to estimate not only the number of parameters that the sensor can sense, which is the number of non-zero eigenvalues, but also by looking at the eigenvectors corresponding to the most largest magnitude eigenvalue, we are able to predict what theta, is that theta one or theta three or theta six, that is most sensitive to the sensor. So basically here, uh, I, I would uh, direct you to, to the paper that we published in uh, Physical Review Research in 2023. I think I have some, some information uh, shared later uh, that uh, you should be able to find this approach. And it's rather simple, uh, just an icon analysis of the Fisher information matrix that can give you two things. One is verification of the number of variables that you can infer. And two is that now given a sensor, what variable is the sensor most sensitive to? Is that true? Is a ligand receptor truly most sensitive to concentration or something else? All right. So that is, uh, that is the first, uh, like a first story. I will only go through the second story very short. Um, and uh, here, uh, the take home message is for, for this multiplexing, by allowing stochasticity to be your friend and looking at the trajectories without averaging them, uh, you should be able to infer more information than simply averaging out the trajectories noise. And the, 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 the systematic approach to analyze that uh, is, is given in the, in, in the paper that uh, I, I had to the first slide there. So now let's go to the second point. That is, can we have a, a general design principle to, uh, to sensors, not only to sense a stationary environment, but also sense a non-stationary non environment or maybe a changing environment. So here I want to give you a very simple uh, kind of a description of a sensor. A sensor, again, described by Markov state, Markov state model with multiple states and each state defines a probability and the probability are changing in time according to the rate. And again, the environment dictates the rate as the environment theta uh, as a function of time will go in uh, go in the rate uh, rate matrix here. So now imagine if you have a same sensor that suffers from two type of environments, theta A of T is one temporal signal of the environment, theta B of T is another temporal signal of the environment. Of course, they might generate different trajectories. And uh, the, here you're seeing an ensemble of trajectories that you might get from the, the process A and ensemble of trajectory given by process B. Now the question is, how can a sensor really tell apart the two trajectories? Well, here we give you the like a, like each dot here it represents one trajectory in the Hilbert space, and you see the red cloud is for process A and blue cloud is for process B. So intuitively, we would agree that if the clouds overlap less, then the sensor is good in telling apart the different theta processes uh, or environmental signals. But how can we characterize this? Well, in the information theory, we know there is a tool uh, called the, uh, uh, the uh, Kubak-like Kubak divergence or relative entropy. But here I want to uh, uh, emphasize that we are defining the Kubak-like divergence, not just about the probability distribution of certain variable, but it's a probability distribution of trajectories. So this definition, even though well-defined, is extremely hard to evaluate because the, uh, well, it, it's, it's really hard to sample the two trajectory space for A and B well enough for, for them to overlap. If there is no overlap for any X that you sampled, then this ratio will be problematic 
after the logarithm, and this thing cannot be estimated. So let me maybe just quickly tell you the result. And here we, we have derived the equality really by a derivation that is similar to how people uh, derived fluctuation theorems, that for any arbitrary non-equilibrium process that, that is also non-stationary, you can calculate the trajectories, uh, kubak leckler divergence for two processes as is decomposed into contributions from time and transitions. So notice here is just the initial kubak leibler divergence between the two systems that is only characterized by the initial distribution. But over time, the trajectory lens from zero to tau, what we're accumulating is a production rate of kubak leibler divergence and the production rate can have contributions summed over all the transition or the edges in the graph where the J here is the probability flow on each edge at any time T, and this F turns out to be the kubal leibler divergence of the waiting time distribution of that transition. So given this formula, we are able to uh, basically design sensors and direct sensors to maximize this, uh, this uh, kubal leibler divergence to give you sensors that not only have the ability to sense a stationary environment, but if I want to tell apart two different processes or two different temporal signals of input, I can have design rules to guide the probability to really flow heavily on the edges that has the largest kubalik leibler divergence of their rates. And then uh, we can design sensors that can, uh, that can uh, uh, be, be very accurate in telling apart this. And this uh, is still uh, ongoing. Uh, uh, Ongoing, we're trying to write uh, write, write up the design uh, design rules, and uh, ho hopefully we can find uh, experimental collaboration uh, to to really test the design and make usefulness of the theory in uh, designing artificial sensors. And here is my take home message. And uh, uh, now I'll, I'll probably stop here. Thank thank you so much.